I guess as I was just alluding to that, it's, I think it's important for us to give you some structure and context with regards to what we're trying to do with the UFC and how we're trying to set up the academy program. Um, if we can go to the next slide, we've got basically what we do is we have an academy of athletes and we're trying to get them into the UFC. We have tiered levels of fighters. So they might be a tier A fire, fighter, which means they're probably one or two fights away from getting in the UFC if they have two wins in a row. We've got tier B and tier C fighters. So there are obviously uh, different levels, but all of them we're trying to mature and develop so that they can reach their ultimate goal of getting into the UFC. We also train uh, any rostered fighter. So there's around 600 athletes on the UFC roster. They're all allowed to utilize our facilities free of charge. So it's a kind of, it's a pretty cool environment that's only just started and been running for maybe eight to 10 months. So overall, it's really important to consider a few things within this presentation. One of the first ones is the communication barrier, which I mentioned previously. A great example of how things can get disconnected is uh, our dietitian, Reed Real, was once having a discussion with one of our athletes about his diet because we needed to help him cut weight to make, make weight for the fight. And so he was just looking at ways that he might be able to uh, change his diet to make it a bit easier for him. So he was utilizing his translator, his dietitian translator, and it came out that the, the fighter ate three big bowls of rice per day. He said, okay, that's, that's going to be something we can change. So the next day he's gone back with a different translator speaking to the same athlete. And it, through this new translator, turns out that this athlete now doesn't even like rice and has never eaten rice in his whole life. So these are some of the communication issues we have. And it's not just because we can't speak Mandarin, but sometimes those messages that get back to us are very mixed. And I think that Paul will be able to go on with this next point because there is definitely different understandings of particular things, particularly with the physiotherapy. Absolutely. Um, so using another example that I had when we first arrived, um, the kind of, the kind of ch Chinese understanding of pain and injury is very different to what we believe in kind of Western society and westernized medicine. Um, and an example was whereby kind of the translator kind of very openly said to me, this athlete is making me ask you this. Is it true that when I eat cold fruit, I will kind of become ill um, on a, you know, cold fruit on an empty stomach that will make me ill. Um, so there are very strong beliefs within China regarding um, pain, illness, and it generally tends to relate to kind of beliefs towards hot and cold, hot being good and cold being bad. So with our kind of fighters that we've had in the academy, we really had to try and educate them towards our understanding of pain and its relationship towards function. And that's something we'll discuss a little bit later on. Um, and kind of looking at them as well, kind of trying to understand where they're coming from, because it's not just a one way street. Um, also just, the understanding of physical therapy, physiotherapy in China. Um, it's a very, very new profession and isn't actually um, recognized as a full-time profession in, by the Chinese government just yet. So the kind of uh, therapeutic interventions that they get are based primarily on very traditional Chinese medicines. Um, so the kind of, as, as a physiotherapist coming in, in working with Chinese athletes is definitely a very different understanding of the role of what we do. Um, a lot of athletes will kind of think that we're there to stop them from training and everything like that. And it's very much the opposite. We're really there to kind of keep them going and try and keep them in the octagon as much as possible. And I, I guess future thoughts for everyone is that it's, we hit the ground running quite literally. We, we had a combine that was held over four days and then on the fifth day, there was a rest. And on the sixth day, we started this program. So with a full-time squad, uh, not knowing who these athletes were, no one has had the opportunity to run an academy program like this in the world before. So we're sort of starting from scratch. Also with the athletes that we had, it's not like coming into a, uh, a team environment, which has been, and that club has existed for a hundred years. And over time, you've been able to develop these processes. So, you know, this presentation is just as much feedback for us and getting insight from what you all think about it, as well as it is to sort of express some of the ideas and thoughts that we've had so far, more than saying, this is the way to do it. 
it's certainly a case of this is what we've done. Really interested to see what you guys think um, about our processes so far. So just looking at this slide here, this is a, an excerpt from the UFC's 2018 cross-sectional analysis. And what we kind of really want to highlight here are kind of some of the differences, particularly within what is deemed a kind of normal athlete, a normative value for an athlete in UFC. So if we look at the ankle over here, we've got kind of dorsiflexion range looking between 19 uh, and 66 degrees. And then looking down towards the neck, kind of ranges of flexion from 15 to 68, 20 to 86 on extension, and then 40 um, degrees to kind of 99 degrees worth of rotation um, through the cervical spine. And really interesting as well is looking at the kind of common training and um, competition injuries, majority of which are all coming from kind of striking. So 64% in fights and 45% of those coming in training. So if we look at the graph on the, or on the right hand side of the screen, we've kind of really got an injury distribution here on, um, for our fighters. So we've got a really high percentage of injuries that occur within competition, about 77%. And both um, training and fight related injuries often have quite a long duration. So we're looking around kind of 50 to kind of 50 odd to 60 odd days of uh, time loss. So this really leads to questions of, can we minimize kind of that 10% of training related injuries? Can we decrease the um, duration of injuries post fight? And also, what does this data look like compared to the data that we've collected in Shanghai? So as Gav said, we've got a kind of reasonably limited amount of data so far, but kind of what we've picked up over the last few months, um, kind of shoulders, are necks and lumbar spine are our kind of top three uh, kind of injury sites that we see. Um, and that's potentially, we, we think at the moment, based on kind of the wrestling dominance of our um, MMA program. Um, and also to kind of head and face injuries and ankles. Comparing that with the UFC PI in Vegas, more kind of upper limb and peripheral injuries really is kind of what they saw originally in 2018. And later on this year, we're hopefully going to be releasing more information um, to kind of update that for the 2020. And this brings us to the, the next part, which gives you a highlight of how we would run our training, I guess camps for lack of a better word. But if someone was to have a fight, they would come back and see us automatically after the fight and then would go home for 10 to 12 days. When they return, we'll put them in that first phase on the left. Paul, if you can use that um, pointer for me, that return to training phase on the left, that will generally run for about one to three weeks. And what we're trying to highlight from this slide is how we work with the technical training and the, and the technical MMA coaches to work out the preference of the high intensity technical training. So whether it's wrestling drills that go live or sparring, at which part of our training phases is it important for them to get involved? So we have return to training, I'll move to general preparation phase here, where we do an SNC profiling and a PT profiling that will help us generate the correct programming moving towards specific prep. And then specific preparation is to get them ready because they've now found out that they've got a fight. And our fight camps last for six weeks. So that early fight camp phase there, that will be the first three weeks and then the late fight camp three weeks leading into the fight. So you can see down below with the red and the blue arrows, we then need to have a higher preference for high intensity training, technical training within the fight camp. So when they're in off camp, which is return to training, general prep and specific prep, Paul and I are able to talk to the head coach and say, you know, we have a bit of a, a niggling neck. How important is it for them to get involved with the live wrestling drills during this time? And we can, we can generally adapt it and make sure that we pull them out so we don't hurt them. When it gets to the fight camp phases, the coach is very keen to make sure that they do the work because if they can't do it, then they're unlikely to be able to do it during the fight. So it's important for confidence and it's important for us to manage that time frame really well to make sure that they're feeling good for their fight and we don't injure them further. So that's, that's kind of a highlight of that whole process would take about 12 weeks, but if they don't have a fight, they'll just keep um, cycling through the off camp phases. So it's just one way that we've looked at um, putting a preference on their training intensity. 
And I think in the next slide, we'll see what that sort of means. So this gives you an idea of, we, we have about 30 fighters. So it's an individual sport in a team environment, which can be really tricky. So we need to make sure that we know where each athlete is at and what intensity that week or that day holds for them. So Paul and I will look at this and we might look at uh, number 10 on the left there is one of the athletes. So athlete number 10, if you look across when it gets to the 16th of March, that's a deload week for him. But there's a bunch of other fighters that actually have to fight during that week. So his preparation before that fight week is going to be a high, whereas everyone else will be on a moderate and then a, and then a taper. So we need to make sure that we're taking into consideration what these greens or these lows mean. In this case, fighter number 10, if he's in an off camp, which he is, then this is where we go. It's a low preference for him to get involved in high intensity technical training if he's got an issue. Whereas if those that are fighting in the wars, which is the local Chinese competition, if they're in that from the 2nd of March to the 9th of March phase that have a little niggle, we need to manage that as best we can, but they need to get involved in that high intensity technical training so that they're actually prepared for the fight. One of the most important factors that we look at at the PI is three, three different things leading into a fight. Don't get them injured, make weight, and then we can focus on the performance elements. So even though they might have a little niggle, Paul has to work really hard and I have to work really hard to make sure that that doesn't get any worse while they're doing their high intensity technical training. So the next slide will tell us what that technical training um, and the non-technical training intensities are. So if you look at the technical component and look across that first row, a high effort would be a live go. So that might mean sparring, or it might mean uh, they're just doing a wrestling session, but they need to go live. It's, it's, it's trying to win. That's considered a high effort or a red zone effort. Um, if they're doing effort drilling, it means you're trying to win, but not, not as hard as what you would in the red zone. And then the green is just purely technical. You're not trying to win. It's very light. It's very flowing. Um, maybe it's pad work or something along those lines. With regards to my area with resistance training and energy system development, we do look at maximal strength and strength speed as being our high effort efforts. Um, the moderate efforts will be more like your power, speed, strength, strength, endurance, and then remedial will be low effort. And you can see below with the energy system work, anaerobic lactic and glycolytic energy systems are gonna to be tough. Uh, and then also the metabolic circuits will require a fair bit of mechanical stress. So we would consider that a high effort. Um, with regards to moderate effort, we could consider anaerobic, alactic, anaerobic, mechanical, so something where it's impact-based, like running. And then the low effort is aerobic, physiological, which means we take them off feet. And so that's kind of how we look at mirroring the technical training to the non-technical training in regards to high, moderate, and low efforts and trying to maintain the fighters into their fight. So as Gav said, we've kind of got a decision-making process to make around the athlete. And ultimately that starts with uh, physical therapy. Um, so as Gav said in the kind of slide where we showed you the kind of process through their camps, we have the athletes coming in from return to training or kind of off camp general prep. And that's an opportunity for us to profile the athlete, get an idea of what their physical limitations are, and then kind of help guide, um, towards some of the process within training, whether that's technical or non-technical. So that's where Gavin and I link up to discuss whether any physical limitations that we may have identified um, are affecting kind of performance in the gym or whether he's even noticed a uh, kind of deficit within a performance marker and ask the question whether there's actually anything from a physical perspective that could be limiting them to kind of not be able to perform quite as well. We then take that discussion towards the MMA uh, head coach and with him we discuss those kind of what we've identified as um, qualities and deficits of the athlete and then we kind of get a perspective from the MMA side to see whether uh, there are any limitations with them from a technical training perspective um, and vice versa. So we then communicate that with our wider performance team, our sports scientists, nutritionists and as a joint team, we make a decision about the process that the athletes need to go through and how we manage their training throughout kind of their training time with us. So just gonna give you a quick overview of our studies. So 
a quick tale of the tape. We've got uh, case study one, which is a 26 year old bantamweight who suffered an acute concussion and he came back in the return to training phase. And then we have case study two, which is a 30 year old featherweight who has a chronic cervical radiculopathy, um, which is an irritation of the nerve around the neck. And, an early, and he's in the early fight camp. So case study one, as we said, he's in the return to training phase. So he's about two weeks post fight. Um, the mechanism of injury was a kind of round two knockout by head kick with up to about two seconds worth of loss of, loss of consciousness from what we understand. Um, clinical markers at the time when he came back to us, he had no active symptoms. Um, so what happens after we have our fighters in, or well, once, once our fighters have their fights, they come back to us 48 hours or so afterwards, we do an initial assessment. Um, and then after that, they get a couple of weeks off from training. So they get a bit of rest party, they go back to their home, um, and they can just take some downtime. So really where we're managing him here is kind of after that downtime. When he came back, he had no symptoms, but he actually did tell us that he was getting nausea and headaches while doing some work on the farm um, back in his hometown. So we know that kind of increased efforts would bring on his symptoms. So that's something definitely for us to consider as we're bringing him back into training. Um, obviously clinical impression is a concussion an estimated return to sport is about 30 days post injury. And we'll take you through the steps that we take to get them towards that now. So first things first is our kind of concussion assessment. As I said, we kind of assess them 48 hours post fight and that's with a sports medicine doctor and um, physiotherapy team. And we perform uh, for concussion specifically, we perform a C3 logics assessment, uh, which includes standard assessments of concussion, symptom checks, balance, um, trailing tests, processing speeds, simple reaction times, choice reaction times, and some visual acuity tests. And we use those to compare um, post-injury to baseline. So we kind of get good markers on that. And those are guidelines that we use through that return to uh, training process to kind of get them recovered. Um, and as I said, he's two weeks after spending time in his hometown. So stage one is rest and recovery. Just having a quick look at some of the C3 logics assessments that we have, um, we have a balance evaluation. So we've got um, measures here of the assessment that we do on that day versus the baseline. And if I show you um, this next bit here, what we do as part of that assessment is we, we, put, we have an iPad with accelerometers within it and we strap it around their waist and it actually give us, gives us these um, um, actual measures and guidelines so we can look at their sway and we can compare their assessment to the baseline. So that's really good information that we can use from this, uh, from this system. Other parts of the assessment are kind of the um, processing speed. So where we have this test key down here. So what they need to do is they need to associate these symbols to the number and they have two minutes to complete as many as they possibly can. Within um, the simple and choice reaction times, it's essentially looking for kind of like a, a, a light assessment. So when the light switches on, you, you tap the screen and that's a, either a single um, test or the choices you get to choose between left and right um, and, it, and it's color coded as well. So that's just an interesting thing that we can do to see the kind of both the physical and the, the mental side or, or neurocognitive side really of the recovery process. So graduated return to training process is very commonly kind of light aerobic exercise. And really we start off with a 20 minute bike, um, continuous steady state up to about 70% 70, 70 max heart rate. And Gav will go into some of these in a bit more detail later on. Um, but what we do is we monitor their kind of rate of perceived exertion and we do a symptom check. So that way we can see if their rate of perceived exertion is kind of exceptional to what we would normally deem uh, their rate of perceived exertion to be for that task. So that is a good indication of their recovery as well. Stage three is taking them to more, more sport specific work. Um, and this again is Gavin will talk about the strength and conditioning side, um, but we also introduce here some non-contact technical training. So here we look at some shadow boxing, some footwork drills, 
um, and also kind of some BJJ warm up. So just some rolling, just getting things, some things um, back into the routine of technical training for them. Our next phase there is to progress them into some more non-contact work. So we then, from the shadow boxing drills, integrate into more some bag work, some controlled BJJ drills so they can work against somebody else, but it's really just flow state work. There's no resistance to it. And very similar to the wrestling drills as well. So we start introducing some of those as we progress through. Stage five is our return to contact phase. So we start with a bit more kind of um, pad work. We increase the drilling intensity for wrestling and BJJ, um, and we get them to in, get involved with some striking drills, but still no contacts towards the head, and there's nothing, no contacts directed towards them. Before our full contact stage, then we're kind of talking a minimum of 30 days, um, and that's really based around some of the kind of guidelines by Naida Karatao from 2019. Um, and those are the kind of really, those are based off the back of the USA boxing. Um, suspension guidelines um, and we also want medical clearance at that stage so we get our doctor to kind of assess the fighter make sure that they're recovering within the guidelines of what we're expecting and that it's safe for them to return to, to contact based work and when we do finally get them to contact we start them off with a three round sparring and then over the next few sessions of sparring that we that we host over the week um, we build those up progressively up to five rounds worth of sparring Across all these stages, we're really looking at RP and symptom checks after each session. The progressions between each phase or each stage, sorry, is um, around 24 hours. And then we're also um, making sure that from, to make sure they can progress, that they're symptom free or there's no aggravation of symptoms across all stages. Somebody else with the mic is on. It's a can of beer, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so, uh, I think a really good point that Paul brought up there is that um, we need to get these guys into very non contact uh, technical training because, in this sport, if you have concussion, generally speaking, that means you lost and you lost badly. So there is a huge psychological compartment to this and that we need to return them back into those movements, into that flow, into that technical training as best we can under the circumstances to make sure they don't lose that confidence as well. So if we have a look at from a strictly an S&C perspective, I'll go through this quite quickly. I think we've got about 10 minutes left. So if one of the things I wanted to highlight is particularly early on, we want to avoid the Valsalva and that intracranial pressure on the head because that's obviously the early stages of that post-concussion issue. So I like to use EQIs or eccentric quasi-isometrics for that, which I'll go through, and really tempo training. So slow, controlled, maybe some isometrics, maybe slow eccentrics to make sure that it's not the load we're putting on them, it's the tempo and the movement, the mechanical movement that we get from them. Now, down the bottom right-hand corner is a uh, highlighted med ball reaction. So Paul spoke about um, testing the reaction with the C3 logics. We also have a baseline test for a fit light reaction test as part of the combine. And over time, we can actually start utilizing this cognitive element into their training with regards to SNC. And I'll also show you a drill that relates to that. Now, this is obviously in the part of the phase five. So, the EQIs, this is a fairly boring video because it's going to be an isometric, but it gives you the idea where he has to hold this um, prone row and he's aiming to hold a really, really, really heavy weight for about 20 to 30 seconds. And then as soon as that load is getting too much for him, he just doesn't drop it. He needs to hold on to that for as long as he can. So potentially another 10 seconds. So he's aiming for... 20 to 30 seconds at full contraction, an isometric hold, and then just hanging on as it gets too heavy. So it'll end up being about an eight to 10 second eccentric. So that's where the EQI comes from. Um, doesn't look like the video is working, Paul, is that right? Unfortunately not, the technical glitch, I'm afraid. Don't matter. It's, it's an isometric, everyone can get it. So the next one hopefully will work because that's a bit more dynamic. And so this is the reaction one that we're looking at. So on the purple light i'll have to do two right crosses 
And on the blue light, they'll need to do a sprawl to a one, single right cross. So basically there, they're looking to not only react, but react correctly, perform a technical movement with power and speed, just much like the fight case scenario. So we're trying to really get more specific towards stage five of that process. So moving on to case study two, um, we've got our 30 year old featherweight. Um, He's in the first week of fight camp, and so he's T minus six weeks, and he gets a training injury uh, where stand up wall wrestling, and his head is forced into kind of lat left sided lateral flexion and extension. So, using some of the wrestling drills. Um, on assessment, the clinical markers were intermittent pain in the left side of the neck, aggravated by left rotation and extension. He was also getting some pain down the arm, uh, down through the C6, C7 dermatome. Um, he also was getting some numbness as well, which I forgot to put on there. Um, but, uh, he had a positive Sperling's test, which is a compression test for the, for the neck. Um, and he was also very markedly had, um, uh, biceps weakness, uh, kind of when you compare it in a kind of clinical environment, four out of five on an Oxford scale, so weaker than his normal. Um, so we're kind of identifying, uh, that he was getting a C5 possibly c67 radiculopathy um probably related to the joints possibly a bit related to disc um and we didn't actually get any diagnostics on this one uh so there are certain complexities surrounding how we can proceed with those but i think that's probably um it is for another discussion at some point potentially um but in this case we didn't feel it was 100 percent necessary that we did proceed with that in terms of estimated return to sport he was in his first week of fight camp. We really wanted to try and see if we could continue towards that. Um, so what we tried to do was kind of, I'll talk through how we managed some of the symptoms, but also try to modify his training so that he could continue to take part, um, but also not aggravate his symptoms too badly. Our target originally was to get him recovered to try about three week mark. So we'll talk about that a little bit more shortly, um, but we didn't quite achieve that. So we, his fight got rescheduled, which gave us an extra three weeks of, uh, of work with him. So really what we're talking about with these guys is the injury, pain, function, structure paradigm. Um, and what we're looking for is kind of looking at the relationship between pain and their function, between pain and what structure is causing that pain. So um, is it simply that the pain is the dominant factor or is there a structural issue that's leading towards that pain? And then also, is there a relationship between uh, structure and function? So is it really just there's a mechanical problem there that they're not moving well enough that's causing an issue? Or is there really a true issue with the structure? So in this case, we're talking about the neck. Is there you know, potentially at risk? Not in this case, but could one of those things in the back of your mind is, are there any kind of potential fractures or anything like that in that area or is it really just an inflammation and irritation of the structure so part of the process of what we're thinking of as we're assessing the individual is how severe are the symptoms what structures are affected and if they continue will it get worse so really what we're looking at here is function versus task demand so with our athlete here we had range of motion which was restricted which had pain and restriction towards the end of his range of his left rotation and his extension. He also had a strength deficit when we assessed that. So kind of um, just isometric holds, he had weakness through, that left, uh, through the left arm. Looking at his neurological status, he had a positive upper limb tension test, so there was tension on that nerve. Really important here in looking and considering, you know, can we continue with the fighter? Is this something we need to stop them from doing? Is this something that we can continue and work around and modify? It was, do they have modifiable factors? And that is really through some of the treatment work that we do. So any of the hands-on therapy and the exercise-based therapies, is it changing their symptoms? So with him, we could see a kind of ease in pain pretty quickly. His range of motion improved and his strength through kind of taking that tension and taking that pressure off the nerve automatically gave him kind of uh, that strength back in a bicep. He was able to re resist uh, the isometric uh, contraction equally to the other side. So that was just after 
some treatment straight away. So that means that his symptoms are kind of lower severity and that we could really try and progress him through. And that's why we took that decision to kind of say, let's see if we can keep him going. So if we're looking at the task demands, we're looking at grappling and striking based work. So we've got combinations of takedowns, slams, clinch work and locks. We've got kicks, punches, elbows and knees. But what's really also important to know is kind of sort of the forces that these guys go through. So when we're talking about the neck, um, grappling work, so takedowns particularly, um, we're looking at between 1,200 to 2,800 newtons worth of force on the neck. Um, and also with striking, we've got kind of 836 newtons worth of force um, and 47.7 uh, newton meters of um, for kind of going through the neck when they're being struck in the head. So we know that they need to be really strong through their kind of neck muscles and neck musculature to make sure that they can cope with the demands of the sport. And that's something that we tried to work on across as we went through. Also, considering that he's in a fight camp, we need to make sure that he can take part in the energy system and strength based training as well to make sure that he can continue to progress towards a fight without aggravating that injury. So here looking at our, our week's training schedule, we've got a, uh, the sessions that we've highlighted here are ones that are ones that we know is going to aggravate are going to aggravate him because it's wrestling based work he get, he did the injury in wrestling and also from some of the assessment work we did very early on we knew that striking wasn't a problem for him also we've got shark tank which we've highlighted so gav i'll just pass over to you to kind of explain that one a little bit cool i'll be super quick basically we're trying to replicate a fight and they'll work depending on which phase they're in or which week they're in within their fight camp they'll either do five five minute rounds of a mix of wrestling pad work um grappling dummies elbowing dummies on the floor back to the air dine for 30 seconds wrestle live on the floor jujitsu for 30 seconds and they just hustle for five minutes and uh, we really redline them on that one. So that they're working up in their high 90 percentile range for their heart rates. It's, it's, it's a terror. So it's a really, really tough session that they need to be prepared for. Also really important is the sparring. So we want to make sure that our, our, our MMA coach, head coach, wants the fighters to be able to spar fully about three weeks away from a fight. And that's where we have that cutoff point around three weeks whether we say yay or nay to whether they can go ahead or whether we need to push the fight back. So those are really important things. And as we said, first time round, the first three weeks, we didn't get to that with him. So that's why we had to push the fight. But essentially the, uh, the feeling is that if you can take part in sparring around three weeks before a fight, you're going to be in a good enough condition to be able to proceed. Cool. So I'll, I'll quickly go through this and hopefully the next video works, but Basically, with this athlete, I'm trying to implement some kind of neck-specific strength training within his S&C sessions. When they're in off-camp, they'll get three sessions a week with me. When they're in fight camp, it's dropped to two. So we go to down to about 13% of getting our hands on them per, out of all the sessions for the week. So it's not a lot of work. So we're also trying to put those um, neck accessory exercises into his technical training warm-ups or non-technical training warm-ups as well. So we get lots of exposure to those drills. So what I'll skip to now is just a, hopefully a video that works of a couple of the exercises um, that we implement. So we have some rotations utilizing the iron neck. If you've never seen the iron neck before, it's a fantastic um, piece of equipment for combat sports and it, you can do a range of different things, even lock in that spinner on the side. So you can do isometrics with that, or you can utilize bands where we can start to put a bit more movement into those isometrics. Here's a reaction or an oscillatory version with a Swiss ball. You can do partner variations where they have to keep that neck strong. And obviously there's a fair bit of trust involved in this one as well, but it's about not moving your posture. So it is an isometric, almost eccentric drill. And then here you can start adding more actions into it by walking backwards and then having to hold the neck strong as that force is coming from behind. So we're hitting it from different angles and hitting it with different movement variations as well. And this is obviously all in a progression within the SNC program. That's really kind of, as, as Gav was saying, those exercises there are kind of things that we've talked about and things that we associate that he needs to be that athlete needs to be working on to get kind of processed through that recovery so that's building looking at his function towards those task demands and bridging that gap um our criteria for 
progression through this is really a stimulus response. So is he responding as we're expecting? So if we load heavy, does he get a little bit of an irritation? If he does, potentially we expect that. And does it settle down? And if it is in a progressive fashion where it's getting better and better as time goes on, that's what we're looking for in terms of those progressions through this. So really what we're taking are kind of his symptoms, strength and his function, and really we're pulling those all together to kind of hopefully achieve that optimum uh, progression and that optimum recovery. And just a parting message and reflection from our head coach here, but thank you very much for listening.